So, obviously, as I said, the goal here is to teach you that surface mount soldering is really, well, I hesitate to say really easy, but um, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, so I'm going to try and run through as many packages today as I reasonably can. Working with this microscope is a lot harder than working with this microscope. Um, it's real slow, like, but, um, so, who here has actually tried to surface mount solder at all before? Who here has been successful with surface mount soldering? <laughs> <laughs> who here has gotten results that they thought looked professional? For you, what you no, no. <laughs> That doesn't count. Um, it's not hard. Um, so, I'm going to go over several techniques today. Um, the most important thing is your tool. Like, the tools really make the difference here. Um, so, the lab has full set of tweezers. Um, this is my own set of tweezers. Um, just uh, the most useful pair of tweezers you'll ever use is a pair of Kirk tweezers. Um, and a good soldering iron. Good soldering iron is really key. Um, and the lab has some, they're hidden away. Um, so if you ask around, you can get them. Um, so here I'm going to try and do just the single most basic component, a resistor. Um, this <laughs> some chewing gum. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna hope you can see well enough there. Um, <laughs> Adjust it too far; it should fall yeah, down yeah. right. Well, that's what I was hoping for, but it just locks there. Wait, wait, wait! Stay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold it, yeah. Uh, the problem is as soon as you bump it, it goes out of touch. I'm going to grab some tape, we'll be right back. Basically, half of the system is based on the... It's like a gooseneck and it's just going... Incidentally, sign up list for the for the is on this chair over here, so if you want to get it on the way out, just put it on the radio. Good mess around. 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 Good mess That's a little better. All right. Um, so one of the pieces of equipment that's also hanging around the lab, board clamp. Um, it's really useful for this. Um, holds your piece flat and off the table for your hands to get at it. Um, so um, with any surface mount, the very first thing you're always trying to do when you're working by hand is to tack your part in place. Um, so, I'm going to go for R3 here, and you'll notice I make a nice little blob there, and then choose a resistor. Um, and when you're making your blobs, you'll figure this out, but you're going to want to figure out what hand you are, whether you're left or right-handed. Generally, you, you hold the tweezers in your off hand. Um, so I just place the, the component down, um, and I'll tap it, and that reflows the solder. But if you can see it from the side, which you probably can't from there, but um, the component is still lifted up a little bit on the side that's tacked. So you just squeeze your tweezers together, push down a little bit, hit it one more time, and it falls flush. And now one side's done. And 
all we have to do is put the pad on the other side. And we've got a fully soldered resistor. Um, so really dirt simple. Um, so you'll run into a lot of resistors, obviously. Capacitors are identical. Um, next thing I want to show you um, is a small outline package. Um, this is a relatively wide pitch, um, and you should have no trouble with this at all. Um, but when you start getting into multi-pin packages, is when you start pulling out this. Um, this is a flux pen. Um, they're like a dollar on DigiKey. The lab is not allowed to stock them for chemical reasons. Um, again, later on I'll talk about solder paste. Again, you can't get it from the lab. Um, but the lab is perfectly happy with you having it here. Um, so flux, for those of you who don't, yeah, flux for those of you who don't know, is a magical substance. Um, it it does two things. Um, one, it's a liquid, and so it improves your thermal conductivity, which is really helpful for getting nice joints. Um, the other is that it clean surface oxides off um, and allows them to burn off. And that's important to get a nice solid joint. Um, so just like with the resistor, the very first thing I want to do is tack this in place. Um, generally, I hit the pads with uh, some flux beforehand. Um, I'll tack one corner. Um, this there's a little bit of art here. Um, you'll notice I go in and I hit the corner of the pad and I want to touch the solder not near the actual pin because otherwise I'll start bumping the IC. If that's a problem, you can get a little solder on the pad and then hold the tweezers down on it and reheat it until it flows up the pin. Um, but so the, pin, the package is like semi-secure right now. So what we'll do, we'll come to the other corner and this one you can be a little more cavalier with. Um, I decide on a position I like it in. Um, this becomes more important on the multi-pin packages, um, the higher pin count, which I'll do later. Um, and so now the IC is solid, and it's really easy. You just run over with the flux pen over the pins and the pads. Um, and I'm just using chisel tip for this, um, and it's probably the right choice for anything you're doing. Um, and I can now just go through one by one and hit each pin. Um, and we have a perfectly surface mount solder part. Um, so, that's the easy stuff. Um, before I get too, too much further, I think I'm gonna show you, um, I think I wanna show you solder paste. Um, so, if you don't know, this is how they actually do real circuit boards in production. Um, what they do is they have piece of plastic or steel or whatever uh, that lays down on top of the board and has cutouts all over your pads. Um, and this is really tiny balls of lead and flux all mixed up into a paste. Um, and what they'll do is they'll run a squeegee over that and it puts just the right amount of solder paste on every pad. And then a machine comes in, drops your components on it, um, and then feeds it through an oven where it gets melted. Um, so when you're doing a lot of passive components, this can still be helpful for you as a person and not just a machine. Um, so one of the difficulties you'll run into is 
solder paste, dries out. Um, it's best to store it in a fridge. I don't happen to store it in a fridge. So just when, you're, when you start, you want to squeeze out the first bit onto a napkin and check it. Um, should also probably be wearing gloves when doing this. And do not eat while using solder paste <laughs> under no circumstances. Um, so what we'll do, we'll come in, just tap a little bit. Um, and you'll see it's kind of messy. And in fact, you'll notice I bridged across that gap, um, which, you know, if you're not used to this, you might be like, oh my god, I screwed up. But that's not a problem. Because the surface tension is magical. Um, so I'll come in. Maybe. Okay. So now all I have to do is take my resistor and just stick it down. Um, and in fact, I can be a little bit sloppy with how I put it down. Um, right here, I'll just squash it down. There's paste coming out both sides, it's a little bit crooked. So now, I move over here. Um, this is an infrared rework station. Um, it's always sitting out in the lab. Um, and it's designed to be fancy, but a lot of the automated controls are difficult to work with. Um, so what you really need to know, there's an infrared lamp up top, um, has the ability to adjust focus here, has a shutter here so you can change the diameter of the, of the spot you're heating. And it also has, down here, It's a little zoomed in, but there's a, there's a ceramic heating plate down there um, that preheats the underside of your board. Um, so we'll take the board. There's a switch on the front. When you turn it on, you'll see this guy come on. Um, and this is a temperature set point controller for the ceramic heater on the underside. Um, the top number is the current number in Celsius, and the bottom number is the set point. Uh, and if you just use the arrows, you can edit the set point. Um, so I'll usually set this like 160, 170. Um, and it's now heating up. There's knobs on the front to change the intensity. Um, and what should happen is that, give this a moment. Um, and if you, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, um, so one of the things that you can't see right now is that. Um, all right, so that's, that's flowed back over here. Um, so you can see that this one has maybe a hair too little solder. You can touch that up manually. This one's got a bunch of solder, but if we were to stick probes across it, we'd find that it's not shorted underneath. It's really hot. Um, <laughs> and uh, so when you've got a board, generally you'll oftentimes put all your passives on the back side. You can go through, you'll get real good at doling out just the right amount of, of solder paste, and then you go through, lay all your passives down, and you've done like an hour and a half of manual work in 20 minutes. Um, so that's really the only purpose I ever see for solder paste. Um, there are people who will disagree with me on that. Um, I've never had much luck with most of the other solder paste techniques. Um, so, come over here.
Um, so now I want to do a quad flat pack for you. If you ever use a microcontroller, which you're fairly likely to, um, it's one of the most common packages you'll see. Um, seen these on circuit boards before. Um, key things to remember, um, one, if you're using our standard circuit board manufacturer, which is advanced circuits around here, um, solder mask, or, or silk screen and solder mask, for the most part, don't cost any money and they don't cost any time. So don't ever make a board without it because you'll really hate yourself when you uh, go to assemble it. Um, so I've got a white dot here. And this small dot on the corner of the package is pin one indicator. So here's where alignment gets tricky. Um, package this large is not the worst because um, the pins are spaced apart. Um, but what you can do is when you're pretty sure you're most of the way lined up, you can tack one corner, twist it a little bit, and tack the other corner until it's just what you wanted. Um, so for now, I'm pretty happy with how this is lined up on this edge. So I will tack it. It shifted a little, but I'm not hugely worried. And then I come over to this corner and decide that I like Sure, push down a little because sometimes the package gets flexed up a little bit. Um, now, just like with the, uh, the straight SOIC package, I will run over the edge the pins. Um, and here's where I want to introduce drag soldering. Um, this is a word you may see on the internet um, and other such places of ill repute. Um, the idea is um, flux will do a lot of the work for you. Um, so we're going to go for this entire side in one pass. Um, and before you saw me, I would lay the solder down and I would tap one pin at a time. Um, well, so now what I'm going to do, I clean my iron, I get some solder on the end of it, put the solder ball down, and as I run over, you'll see it just creeps up the pads. Um, and sometimes, this will result in a short. Um, but I just got all those, no shorts. Um, I will now attempt to intentionally short them. Um, so if you use too much solder, what you'll end up with is right here on the end. It's a little hard to see from that angle, but you'll notice that the three pins on the bottom corner are all bridged underneath. Um, that visible? Yeah. yeah. So, I have a chunk of solder wick. Maybe. Another chunk of solder wick. Ed, thanks. Do the best. <laughs> oh, I found it. And now he's just going to go get it. <laughs> um, So now we can just come in and just press this on top of the pads, heat it up, and the solder flows out. And it's clean. Um, sometimes that'll end up removing too much solder. It's sort of to your best judgment. Under this microscope, it's a lot easier to inspect things from the edge. Um, 
and that's a really good technique when you're soldering is once you're done soldering a package like this, lift it like 45 degrees and slide the microscope up so you can still focus on it and get a look underneath the pins because sometimes you'll short underneath there and you'll need to do something about that or else you'll be sorry. Um, so, just a quick run over the rest of these. There we go. In you know, nominally a minute and a half of work, I have a full package soldered. Um, How many pins was that? Sixty-four. <laughs> um, yeah, so admittedly this is a fairly large pitch package. Um, this is uh, this is a either TQFP or PQFP uh, 64. Um, but all the quad flat packs come in multiple pitches, which is the space between the pins on each uh, side. Um, and so for example, this is a much finer pitch device. I think I'm about to do. Um, this is where the drag solder really comes in handy because you it's borderline impossible to do each pin by itself uh, when it's this fine. Um, also just as an anecdote, um, the part I'm installing right now is from a company called FTDI. Um, and no, I do not work for them, nor am I getting compensated. Um, it's a fantastic little chip, um, and when you're doing microcontroller work, um, it's the easiest way to communicate with a microcontroller. It's a little USB to serial port converter, and if you're not familiar, all microcontrollers, with essentially zero exceptions, will have a serial port on them. Um, and this way you just have a USB port on your board, and plug it into your computer and you can suddenly make your project that much more interesting. Um, so alignment on this is going to be a little trickier. Um, and sometimes it helps um, for real cheap on DigiKey, like five bucks, you can get one of these. It's just a set of dental picks. Um, and not to be used for other purposes. Um, and you can peg down a pen and hold it, which is a lot easier to do with a real microscope. Um, but since I decide I like it, another trick for tacking parts, um, just like drag solder, you clean your iron, get just the tiniest bit of solder in there. Um, and then, so I've already positioned this chip and like it, so I push down on it, and that way it won't move. And I just hit the corner and attack that pin without needing to deal with three hands of holding the package, feeding solder, and This side. That pin's tacked. Um, so with these fine pitch packages, it's really key to just drench your pins in flux, and it will really make life a lot easier. Um, Fine pitch packages, it's a lot harder to not end up with a bridge at the end. Um, it's really a matter of just practice of getting just the right amount of solder on your iron. So I'll run through, do all the pins. Yeah, like I said, this really isn't, doesn't need to be hard. Um,
frankly, I'm doing this without the microscope, so with the microscope, it's a lot easier. So I ended up with like two bridges there. Um, and keep your solder clean and just makes your life easier. You make it work if you don't. But Especially with packages like this, it's real easy to miss a, uh, a bridge that's underneath. So you want to make sure you check. So, done. Another 64 pin package. Again, nominally two minutes. Um, so, um, next interesting bit. Um, you'll definitely run across um, crystals, or in this case, a. Uh, an oscillator. Um, and so any microcontroller needs an oscillator. Um, you can, you'll find in data sheets, they'll encourage you to use a crystal. Um, if it's your first project, don't use a crystal. Um, crystals are great for mass production because they're cheap. Um, they're incredibly sensitive to their load capacitance. Um, and so you can end up with a situation where it doesn't turn on, you're not sure why, because it turns out your scope probe can't actually probe a crystal. Because by probing the crystal, you've put enough capacitance on the circuit that it won't oscillate. Um, or if it does oscillate with your scope probe on there, then you know you're doing it wrong. Um, but so these guys are just, um, it's just a little tin can included in the can, it's everything you need. You just give it a, a voltage source and it outputs uh, square wave um, with almost the exact same accuracy that you can get out of a crystal. Crystals will be more reliable over temperature, but like I said, oscillators just boot and you can curve them and it's just all kinds of good. Um, so again, just going to do a little blob on one path. Um, now, it's this is where it gets a little tricky because this, this guy doesn't have leads. Um, so you can see it's just these gold pads on the bottom. Um, sometimes helps. Just tap it with the uh, flux. Um, thing to be aware of, when you're done with a board that you've been manufacturing with flux, you need to wash the board and like literally scrub it in hot water. Um, and then leave it off, obviously, until it dries. Um, but uh, especially the chemical flux will slowly erode the wires, um, and over the course of the device, will kill it. Um, so. just like the other ones. So this is similar in many ways to a QFN, which is a package that I'll show you in a minute. Um, the pads, you can see these little divots right on the sides. Um, the gold pad extends up the side, 
and that gives you a really good place to uh, to heat up and wick solder into. Um, down for you right now. Um, you'll notice that we have a shield back here that actually sits above these pins. Um, so when you make your footprint for this uh, device, um, you want to leave a little bit of extra exposed pad so that you can feed solder into it and have it wick up. Um, it's a good thing to be aware of that when you look at data sheets, they'll give you a recommended footprint that is 99 times out of 100 designed for machine soldering where they don't need any external access to the pins. Um, so take a look real carefully at the package measurements. See what the outer width of the package pins are um, and if that is exactly the width of the pads then you're going to want to fix that because otherwise it'll be a lot harder to solder. Whereas if you have lots of nice exposed copper you can sink heat in and slide solder in and far away. So this part, I am only ever successful when I use flux. Um, you know, some parts you can get away without using flux. This is not one of them. But we will tack down the shield. Make sure we like the position. And then Holler out if you can't see something that I'm doing. Um, we've got two sides of the shield, and now here I'm just going to come in underneath the pads, and you can see the, the solder that's coming out on my pads, um, and if you look from the edge you can see that it's actually whipped under. Um, shield. So now, the QFN, the evil QFN. Um, so this is what the footprint for a QFN looks like. Looks pretty harmless, just a little small. Um, but, catch is, let me actually get the part out. We'll find there's no leads. Um, there's nothing extending up the sides. Um, this is essentially the hardest part you'll have to deal with. Um, so like you can see, it's just plastic and there is nothing coming up the sides. Um, so this is, um, there's several different ways to do this. Um, I'm going to show you what I've been using recently. Um, one technique that does tend to work well is to give yourself like, like almost twice the package width in uh, lead out on the on pads, and then you can wick solder underneath if you need to. Um, you can do this with solder paste. Um, again, I've I've had limited success, um, but so what I do is a multi-stage process. We come in, we're going to take 
The idea is to get just a little bit of tin on each pad um, so that they're just a little bit thicker. Um, and it's easiest to do that by just swiping on the pads like away from them. Um, So you can tell there's a little more texture to them now. Um, and now, go nuts with flux. Um, get whole bottom of the package. Get the pads again. Um, now, Tedious work placing it. This is actually the hardest part: is is positioning it. Because um, once it's positioned, it should fix itself through surface tension. Um, but if you're off just a little bit, it'll slide onto the wrong pads, and you'll be unhappy. Um, so I think that's centered properly. And you just give a little bit of a tap to lock it in place. And we come over to the reflow station and we cook it. Um, now this is this is a process that takes some finesse and you'll just sort of have to watch it. See if you think it's doing what you want it to, um, and it may require some rework. Um, but, oh, and if you start taking with it too much, you'll be sorry. Like I am. <laughs> um, If you use the rework station a lot, um, the light will probably start to annoy your eyes pretty quickly. Um, there's a set of goggles on the table over there that you can absolutely use. Um, alternatively, a good pair of sunglasses is a good thing to have. So, I am happy with the positioning, but I don't think I have enough solder on there. So, now that it's solidified, it's going to hold its position a lot better. <coughs> so, it doesn't want to go anywhere. Um, so, come back at it. More flux right in the corners everywhere you can. And then we'll use the excess pad that I have there to try and suck as much solder underneath the board as possible. Um, so see how they're kind of flat right now? Um, and now they're a little bit filleted. So, I'm fairly confident that that guy is um, soldering. Um, 
fairly confident that this is uh, actually soldered properly. Um, QFNs are a problem. Oh, and I'm short. It's gone. Um, QFNs are very difficult to verify. Um, and oftentimes it comes down to uh, if you can probing with a with an ohmmeter at adjacent pads, seeing if they're shorted. Um, but at some point you got to bite the bullet and power your circuit on and hope it doesn't blow up. Um, <laughs> if you were in industry, you'd have an X-ray inspection machine that would do it for you, but not an option. Um, so my recommendation is, if it's your first board, steer clear of QFNs. Um, they're not undoable, and you will at some point run into a problem where. Someone's made the perfect IC for you, but it's a QFN only. Um, it's a cheaper package for them to manufacture, so they like it, and machines don't have a problem with it. Um, so you do have to get used to it. Um, Would you want to, on the silk screen layer, put a outline so that you can make sure you yes. have position properly? Um, yes, that's very important. Um, you'll notice, well, it's too late now, but um, the pin one marker on this device was just a, a cutout on an internal rectangle. Um, it was real hard to see. Um, it's much nicer to do your outline that's designed to be right at the edges so you can center it on the silk screen. Um, the catch with that though is that uh, generally your indexing tolerance on the copper layer versus the silk screen layer may be as much as 10 mils, um, which might be enough that it's no good anymore. Um, so, it's kind of a crapshoot, um, and it's really up to you what, which way you want to do your, your, your solder mask. Um, so, um, so, that's pretty much everything that you'll run into um, for basic soldering, um, and that will manufacture just about any board that you want to build. Um, there's a couple other component types. Um, this is what's called an SOT23. Um, they're very common for single transistors. Um, I don't have any to show you right now, but the technique is identical to the resistors or any other part. You, you're going to want to tin one pad, place the component, tack it, and then do your other sides. Um, the other thing I didn't get into is voltage regulators. Um, the, you'll find any voltage regulator has this big thick tab um, and you want to you wanna tack on that and you want to make sure that it's really nice and float because it's really easy to get a cold solder drum there. Um, other than that, um, I guess the one other really important skill when you're making your first circuit board is green wiring. Um, so I think Mike Tweak said it best. Um, being really good at green wiring is like winning because you have the biggest pimple. You win and yet you still lose. Um, <laughs> you're inevitably going to mess up. Um, and uh, for example, the first revision of this board, I wanted an extra set of wires that wasn't there. Um, so we have this 30 gauge wire. Um, it's really good for this. Um, it's kind of difficult to strip, but we have four steps in the back. Um, and clamp it. Nice set of strippers and we've got a strip wire. Um, so let's say um, we'll just say corner of this micro. Let's say that was an I.O. pin that I wanted to use and didn't get a chance. I didn't wire it out for whatever reason. Um, you can take this wire and I'm only going to do one side for you. Um, but it helps to build up the solder that's there. Um, so we 
get a nice thick blob. And then, So this is really about fine motor skill here. Um, and this is maybe not something that everyone can do. Um, but with practice, it's not that hard. Um, so we've got that. And now that's weakly soldered. Um, and what you're going to want to do, I'm not going to finish this because I don't actually want to do that. Um, you'd want to take and put right here a dab of hot glue. Once that cools, then you can cut the rest of the wire the length, chop it off, strip it, and put it in the right place. Um, and you're gonna wanna tack it down with hot glue in several places, because otherwise it'll come loose. And it'll get ripped off and you'll rip the pin off, or who knows what. Um, so. Pretty much, I think that's everything. Did you talk at all about um, how you make the, the silk screen itself? Like, do you send a, a design to the company? Mm -hmm. Can you yes, okay. So, yeah, so for those of you that aren't familiar, um, I think we're giving, are we giving you an Eagle Talk? Uh, have you, um, at some point yes, this some semester, point. we're going to give an Eagle Talk. Um, Eagle. So, your printed circuit design layout software um, will generate files that are the copper layers and the silk screen layer and the solder mask layer. Um, and then you just send those all off to the manufacturer and they take care of it. Um, we have, um, as students, you get a really good deal with this company called Advanced Circuits and it tends to be who we use in the lab. Um, we make a four layer board for $66 a piece up to 30 square inches. You can make a two layer board up to 60 square inches for $33 um, with full silk screen inside a mask. It takes about two weeks. Um, and yeah. Um, uh, can you just reiterate the, uh, the idea of whenever you're actually designing to design your pads, you don't have to use solder paste? Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's. Um, that's something you'll get with experience, um, but it's an experience you won't like. Um, make sure that um, you'll, as you're reading data sheets, oftentimes they will have uh, a recommended footprint, uh, but that is never the recommended footprint for hand soldering. Um, and so you need to design things a little differently, which actually brings me to another point. Um, this is a problem that you may or may not run into. Um, so, where are we? There we are. Okay. So, what we've got here is two capacitors side by side. Um, and it's because they're two different orders of magnitude. Um, but, the problem is where they join to the power plane. Uh, is immediately adjacent, and you'll notice that there's no solder mask covering the trace between them. Um, so, this isn't a real problem if you're doing everything by hand. Um, but if you're using any solder paste, when you try and solder paste that, uh, all the solder paste will suck itself right down the hole um, and will just plug the hole. And so, you'll have to do those parts by hand. And you can actually do things called via in pad, um, where you would actually have the via on the pad. And that just makes the situation worse. That being said, there's times where you want that. Um, if you're routing a really tiny circuit board and you need to get a lot of stuff on there, um, it can really help with your routing. Um, but when you do that, you either have to fill all the holes manually, or for an extra price, you can get the circuit board manufacturer to plate over it. Um, but that's not really within the realm of what you want to pay. Um, so. Um, yeah.
other than that, um, what about um, solve grid array packages and those TQFNs with exposed ground fibers? So, okay, so a QFN with an exposed ground pad, um, you'll do just the same way that I did the other one, um, only you're going to want to make sure you have as, as minimal ground pad, uh, as minimal solder on the ground pad as possible because otherwise it will bubble up and support the entire package. Um, ball grid arrays are a different beast. Um, they're the one package that is almost out of reach. Um, the, the biggest problem you'll run into with ball grid arrays is that any serious ball grid array you won't be able to route um, because there's minimum requirements on trace width and trace spacing and hole size and hole spacing um, that without paying a lot of extra money you can't get done um, by the manufacturer. Um, so you'll find that if like you had a 100 ball grid array um, you wouldn't be able to route out signals from the inside. Um, you just have nowhere to go. Um, so, that being said, small ball count arrays are doable, um, and they're not the worst. Uh, they're actually in some ways better than, than QFNs, um, because the solder balls are already there, and so you don't need to do anything. You just flux it, stick it, and heat it. Um, and one of the things I couldn't really demonstrate, but you'll see when you play with the, the hot air, is, or the, the IR, is that uh, you can actually watch the package flow. And you'll see the whole thing adjust itself. Um, and like resistors will pull themselves in line, capacitors will pull themselves in line. Um, occasionally you'll get what's called tombstoning, where if you have too much solder paste on one side and almost none on the other, the component, the surface tension will lift the component vertical. Um, and that can be a pain in the butt. Um, but if you just keep a pair of tweezers in your hand while you're watching it, you can push down and fix that. Um, the one other thing I didn't touch on, which I can, um, this will probably be best <coughs> for this guy. Because they don't know how to make this work. Uh, no one has had to be I think you hit it before on the bottom of the table. Okay. 
So now you can get a better feel for this. Um, so what I want to show you is how to rework components. So from time to time, I build a board and decide that some component's dead, or for whatever reason you need to remove a component or swap it. Um, it happens every day. Um, all the time. Um, so, you can see absolutely nothing in that bright dot. Um, so, one of the tricks you can use is we have a hot air gun. Um, and so, there's two knobs on the front. There's heat and airflow. Um, sadly, they are not numerical. <laughs> they do not have degrees marked on them. Um, but I think I'm still getting used to this guy. I think I run it around six for temperature. Um, so now on this package, it's not as big a deal. The IR will do all the work if you need it to. But when you've got large pin count packages, like 100 pin packages, 200 pin packages, it's oftentimes hard to get the whole thing heated or get it heated quickly without destroying the rest of the board. So what you can do is you use the hot air to assist the heating and localize it. And, and you can't see anything. Um, so yeah, and now it's free. Um, when you're done removing a component, um, so you can see how those pads are, are brighter than the rest and they're actually a little raised. Um, you'll probably need to go over the pads with solder wick um, to clear off any excess solder um, before trying to go to the next component. Um, the other thing is when you turn this off, it will keep flowing for a little bit. It's just to cool it off. Um, yeah, I think that is just about it, unless anyone has any questions. Is there any hot tweezers in the lab? Hot tweezers? No. Those are for cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> or people with lots of money. <laughs> um, yeah? How do you use the iron? So, that's an interesting bit. Um, the irons in the lab that we have that require you to set temperature are not very good. Um, we have, so, this is my own iron, but we have a couple similar to it. Um, it's made by a company called Metcal. Um, and the tip actually determines the temperature. You don't set the temperature. Um, they actually have a nifty little bit where the end, the whole thing is an RF power supply. Um, and the heating element at the end is a material that above its Curie point will not absorb energy. Below its Curie point, it will. So they manufacturing the material to have a Curie point at exactly what temperature they want the iron at, which means that you've got closed loop control where the feedback element is actually at the point of actuation. So you, you end up not being able to get cold spots on your iron, um, which is really nice. Um, but that said, um, this is 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 700 degrees is necessary if you need um, lead free. Anyone else? Alright, I live in the hovel over there, and I'm always happy to help with soldering, within reason. <laughs> <laughs>